Hello, I'm Jonathan Dunsky, author of The Adam Lapid Mysteries. On this channel, I often talk about books that I read and enjoyed. I usually talk about crime fiction, but because I also write crime fiction that is set in Israel, I'm going to tell you about a history book about the time of the British Mandate of Palestine uh, that took place between 1918 and 1948, when the State of Israel was established. The book uh, was written by an Israeli historian called Tom Segev. I read the Hebrew edition, the original edition, but the book has been translated into English and you can find it uh, on bookstores and book websites um, under the name One Palestine Complete or perhaps under the name Palestine under the British, which is what the Hebrew, the English name is, the way the English name is listed here in this edition, but I checked on uh, Amazon and there the book is called One Palestine Complete. Now, um, incidentally, if you uh, just did a you know, direct translation, little translation of the name in Hebrew, it would be Days of the Anemones. Uh, anemone is a red flower which is quite common and beloved in Israel. And because some of the British soldiers who served there had red caps, uh, the local Jews called them anemones. And this is how they remained in the uh, public memory uh, of people who lived there and of generations of Jews since. Now, the book is quite interesting. I had a great time reading it. And it tells the story of how the British assumed control of the land of Israel, of that region, uh, during the uh, First World War, they invaded that region from Egypt in 1917 and they drove the Ottoman Empire out and they basically took control of that land. Now, the British in 1917 um, created what was called the Balfour Declaration and it stated that the British government uh, was going to establish what it called a Jewish national home in that place, in what was then called Palestine. And it would do so in a way that would ensure the uh, rights of all the people in residence there, Jews and non-Jews. But this was the policy. And, and this was part of what drove the British into uh, invading that, that region and of their consequent actions as they administered it. Now, the book uh, is, is written in a way which is as far away from dull and dry as you can imagine. It, it, sometimes it even reads like, like, a, like a gossip column, of course, but much more detailed and knowledgeable. And it does so both by focusing on uh, the important characters uh, of the story, politicians, uh, army officers, and uh, later uh, various uh, leaders of militant groups, both on the Arab side and on the Jewish side. But it also focuses on a number of ordinary people who lived uh, in that area in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, or elsewhere, and who either wrote uh, diaries or a large volume of letters, and this body of work had, had, had survived. And through their writing, we can sort of get a glimpse into what ordinary people um, were making of the changes occurring around them, and there were many changes indeed. The, the first change was, of course, the British, uh, the, the First World War with the British invasion, and all the hardship that it caused. Then uh, there was the Balfour Declaration, which even came a bit before that. And now the British administration is, is, is rising and assuming control of the land. And there is the struggle between Jews and Arabs, between the Zionist movement, and the sort of incipient and slowly developing uh, Arab national movement in that area. Now, the most interesting thing that I picked up from the book was how certain individuals in the Zionist movement managed to influence um, 
the British government, the British Empire, to support Zionism in its cause to establish a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Um, first and foremost, there was Chaim Weizmann, who later became Israel's first president. And Weizmann was uh, a very successful uh, scientist, and he lived in, in Britain uh, during the First World War, and he was a man of great influence and charisma and personal charm. And he managed to make uh, friendly connections with high-ranking British officials and uh, politicians. And through that, he managed to influence the entire policy of the British Empire in regards to Zionism and the land of Israel. And this is quite incredible because the Jews at the time had virtually no real power. Um, of course, and in comparison to the British Empire, this was even more stark. But Weizmann managed to convince some British officials that the Jews had more power than they really had. And he even sometimes uh, seemed to have used, or at least the author of this book claimed that Weizmann had played on uh, various anti-Semitic beliefs, even among those British officials who supported Zionism, that uh, they believed that the Jews had this global power, global network of connections, that they were involved in you know, finance and politics and, and all, all that sort of stuff, and that it would be in Britain's interest to support Zionism because then they would be uh, on the side of the powerful Jews. This was, of course, largely nonsense. The, the Jews were um, almost without real power at the time. And part of the reason, there were, there were other reasons why Britain decided to support Zionism. Uh, many of uh, its leaders and uh, politicians were uh, highly religious, and they believed that uh, the Jews were destined to return to their ancient homeland and to establish a state there. This was sort of God's plan, and they were now assisting in it. And they also viewed um, Zionism and Judaism as something more closer to, uh, let's say, to Europe and to their, the way that they viewed the world and the way they envisioned how societies should uh, should function. So, the Brit Britain invaded in 1917. By 1918, it had complete control of the land. And then a few years later, it was given a mandate by the League of Nations. The League of Nations was sort of the precursor to the United Nations. Britain was given a mandate. And part of that mandate, part of the responsibility was to uh, enact or to uh, realize the Balfour Declaration to help the Jews create a Jewish national home. Now, naturally, the local Arabs um, did not like that particular idea. And, and in the book, uh, Tom Segev, um, through the writing of, of one particular Arab and, and some others, he sort of gives voice to their opinions and their fears and um, and their ambitions. Um, and he doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't, sh he doesn't you know, portray them as noble, but he doesn't portray them as completely evil at all. He just lets the words uh, that they have left sort of speak for themselves. Um, now, during the British rule over uh, the British Mandate of Palestine, there were several occasions in which uh, violence erupted, Arab violence against the Jews, and Tom Segev tells the story of each of these uh, large conflagrations in 1921, in 1929. Um, we're talking about region-wide riots and, and eruptions of uh, violence that resulted in many Jewish deaths, and in some cases also Arab deaths, when British uh, police officers or soldiers tried to quell these uh, these violent acts. And in the late 1930s, there was also a widespread Arab revolt that 
was stretched out over three years between 1936 and 1939. And Tom Segev also goes into that. And because of these um, eruptions of violence, slowly the Jews also develop their own fighting force, first for defense, and then uh, it also um, sort of created an offensive side to it, first to protect, just to protect themselves against the Arabs, and also slowly to build their own military capabilities, because as, as time went by, it appeared to more and more Zionist leaders that there, were, there was going to be uh, a big conflict with the Arabs, that their original plans or the original beliefs that they would be able to establish a Jewish national home without uh, going to war against the Arabs were apparently not going to come true. Um, so this, the, the novel, not the novel, the, the book is rich in detail and rich in history and also with uh, some very uh, interesting anecdotes. Uh, just two of them that spring to mind is that when uh, Minister Balfour, the British minister, uh, he had a conversation with uh, Chaim, Chaim Weizmann. And at the time, there were various ideas of settling Jews, not in the land of Israel, but just somewhere else, maybe in Uganda, maybe other places in Africa. And Balfour raised this uh, possibility before Weizmann, and Weizmann just you know, uh, refused outright. And, and he said something to, along the lines to, to Balfour that, uh, would you give up uh, London if we told you that you could you know, move to Paris? And, and Balfour said to him, you know, sort of astounded, but London is ours. And Weizmann replied something to the effect that Jerusalem was ours when London was just swampland. And there you have it, the, the story, you know, the long connection, historical connection of Jews to Jerusalem and to the land of Israel that stretches more than three millennia. Another uh, funny anecdote was when Winston Churchill in 1921, he was the minister of the colonies. And as part of his duties, he, he made a visit to, to, the, to the region. He visited Jerusalem and he also visited Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv at the time was not the bustling city that we know today. It was just basically a neighborhood with sort of bigger aspirations, but at the time just a neighborhood. Um, 12 years old um, and gradually developing. And the uh, head of the council was a guy called Mayor Dizengoff, who later became the first mayor of Tel Aviv when, when it became a city. And he... And in Tel Aviv at the time, there was a boulevard called Rothschild Boulevard. Now, the plan was to have a tree-lined boulevard, very lush, um, just like a European boulevard. But at the time, the trees there did not, uh, had not had enough time to grow. So Dizengoff brought in some mature trees from somewhere else and just stuck them in the ground for this visit by Churchill. Now, Churchill came and there was a procession and there were a lot of people around, and then some children wanted to see better, so they started climbing these mature trees, and the trees toppled over. Now, Churchill, uh, ever the gentleman, said something to the effect of, uh, something to the effect to Dizengoff, that uh, without uh, roots, uh, Mr. Dizengoff, this is not going to work. <laughs> now, this is a sort of a funny anecdote, but it, I think it, it tells, it has a, a, a large degree of symbolism because the Jews had roots and have roots and had roots in that region, roots that go back, as I said, more than three millennia, but they were now reestablishing those roots. They needed time for these roots to grow into luscious trees, and these roots were not just about trees, but about uh, society in general, cultural institutions, uh, just villages and kibbutzim and cities and towns and everything that has to do with uh, running a community and running just the life of a people. So the book is filled with these 
sort of stories and anecdotes and historical detail, and it's quite fascinating. Uh, I cannot attest to the uh, to the translation into English because, as I said, I read it in Hebrew. But I imagine that um, a, a good translator did this book justice. Now you can find a link in the description below to where you can pick up a copy of the book in English. And if you're interested in that time period, in the sort of history of Israel and the history of what came before Israel was established, uh, I highly recommend reading this book. And I read it because I am always trying to learn more about that time period in order to write my Adam Lapid stories and novels. And um, I don't know if I picked anything out of this book that will one day you know, emerge into or develop into an idea for a novel. Sometimes it takes my mind a uh, sort of length of time in which to uh, go over and process things that I learned and then an idea will emerge from them. And I hope that something will emerge from this novel, but if not, just the rich historical background and detail will certainly help me write um, more vivid and immersive historical mysteries uh, featuring Adam Lapine. So thank you for watching the video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel and giving this video a thumbs up. I'll see you in the next review. Until then, I hope you're reading something good.